it's great to sort of have that uh, those opening remarks uh, from our uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs sort of sets up the context, I think, um, uh, for uh, today's and tomorrow's uh, proceedings. Um, just uh, my name is Derek Hand. I'm the, the Dean of the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences here uh, in DCU. And it's a great uh, privilege to be able to uh, chair this uh, opening session. Um, in many ways, Brexit uh, and the protocol, um, it's not just one thing, it's many things. And I think um, today and tomorrow, issues around economics, around politics, around sort of the cultural consequences um, of the protocol of Brexit will be sort of touched upon. And I think that's really interesting. And I think there's no question, and we're very good at it here in Ireland, talking talking things through, but not just talking for the sake of it, but hopefully to find uh, ways of, of dealing with um, these real, very real uh, issues. So um, this first panel is the context, and we have uh, three speakers, uh, Michael Keating, Katie Hayward, and Oren Doyle. Um, they will each give a paper for 15 minutes or so, um, and then uh, we can have questions after the three have, um, have, have given their uh, thoughts and we can get some um, um, interaction from the audience and you can, um, I suppose, put questions on chat uh, and uh, also um, if you put your hand up or use the, the facilities of Zoom, put your hand up and we can, you can ask your question uh, in person uh, as it were. Okay, so the first um, uh, speaker talking around the UK devolution and disintegration uh, is Professor uh, Michael Keating, who is a research professor at Aberdeen, funded by a European grant on differentiated integration in the EU and leading a section on external association uh, with the EU. His uh, research interests include comparative European politics, territorial politics, and nationalism. And his recent books include The Independence of Scotland, Rescaling the European State, uh, State and Nation in the United Kingdom, uh, The Fractured Union, and has edited volumes debating Scotland and the Oxford Handbook of Scottish uh, Politics, all from Oxford uh, University uh, Press. So uh, without much further ado, I'd like to ask uh, Michael to kick off uh, the, today's proceedings. Thanks, Derek, and, and thanks to the Institute for the invitation to participate in this seminar and in the larger project. I'd like to have been with you all in Dublin, but I'm here in Italy in the sunshine, which is probably the next best thing. Uh, I circulated a paper on this topic, and there's also a longer version, which Derek just mentioned, a book for those of you who could afford it or can get it online, States and Nation in the United Kingdom, The Fractured Union, and it's about the fractured union and the effect of Brexit on that that I want to talk just now. When I was discussing this with Federico a few months ago, we agreed that I would do everything except the Irish border, because the rest of you are doing that. But rather look at the effects of EU membership and then Brexit upon the territorial constitution of the United Kingdom. And that's what I'll be focusing on. Now, the central premise of the pro-Brexit people, as far as I can understand it, is that the United Kingdom is a unitary nation state with a single people bounded by the principle of parliamentary sovereignty in relation to its external relationships and internally as well. We could talk a long time about the doctrine of parliamentary sovereignty. Fundamentally, I think it rests upon a tautology, but let's uh, put that aside for a moment and just say the position of the Brexit people is that this is incompatible with membership of the European Union with the supremacy of European law and all the supranational apparatus that goes along with this. And therefore, the only way of resolving this constitutional question is a total and absolute Brexit with a complete restoration of absolute parliamentary sovereignty. Now, parliamentary sovereignty immediately after the referendum was kind of transmuted into popular sovereignty with the slogan, the British people have voted for Brexit which was a very interesting slippage in constitutional argumentation, but it doesn't fundamentally change my point that whether it's the unitary British Parliament or the unitary British people, uh, that is the claim that is being made. And in either case, it, it's incompatible with the European project. 
But there is and always has been an alternative interpretation of the United Kingdom, which exists in political science, in law, in history, many disciplines adhere to this, which is that the United Kingdom is an asymmetrical plurinational union with no agreement on fundamental elements of a polity, namely the demos, who are the people, is there a people? Secondly on telos, what is the purpose of the union? What is the trajectory of the union? Is this agreed or contested? Uh, on ethos, that's governing values. And finally, on sovereignty. On the contrary, these are things in the United Kingdom that are constantly debated and never resolved and never really need to be resolved. And of course, the Good Friday Agreement uh, and everything that goes around it is a good example of that kind of thinking. But similarly, in Scottish judicial and political thought, that is a pretty firmly anchored principle. And that was given institutional recognition when finally, after 100 years of 150 years of debating, home rule all around uh, was introduced for the peripheral parts of the United Kingdom at the end of the 20th century. Now, my point is that if we see the United Kingdom as a plurinational union without an agreement on demos, telos, ethos, or, or sovereignty, far from being incompatible with the European Union, it is a very good fit because that is exactly what the European Union is. Uh, and so that is really the fundamental basis of everything that I'm going to say. A way of understanding constitutionalism and political order that is alien to that Westminster, the old Dicean doctrine, but in fact, perfectly compatible with some of the underlying assumptions in the devolution settlement and with membership of the European Union. And therefore, Brexit is profoundly destabilizing because it has taken away the external support system, not only for the devolution settlement, but also for the deeper and longer term understanding of the nature of the United Kingdom and try to substitute a unitary doctrine of unitary statehood and peoplehood and sovereignty that never really existed and certainly has not existed since the end of the 20th century. What did the European do? First of all, the EU introduced a discursive space for ideas about shared and divided sovereignty, which found an echo in the Good Friday Agreement. They found an echo in Scottish doctrines about the nature of sovereignty and the idea of, of, of the Union. They even provided a framework in which we could discuss Scottish independence because it would not mean the end of all unions, it would just mean a reconstitution and reconfiguration of union in different ways. Uh, it provided um, an internal market, a system of supranational regulation that meant that the devolution settlement could be much more extensive, much more asymmetrical and dispense with all kinds of framework laws because they were provided by Europe. Very few people in London realized this, how much EU law applied directly in Scotland and didn't have to go through London, how much that Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland were able to exercise the same degree of discretion in the implementation of EU law and directives within their field of competences as a member state. Uh, and this enormously facilitated the way that devolution was uh, operated in, in practice. And, and then the test uh, of this was the vote in the overall EU referendum vote in 2016. The EU voted by, sorry, the UK. Many people keep on mixing up UK and EU. I just kind of, when they're saying this, we all do it very unconsciously. Anyway, the UK voted by 52% to leave. And as Margaret, as, I think, as uh, Theresa May famously said, uh, the British people have decided on Brexit. The British people have spoken. This notion of the British people constantly evoked. When in Scotland, 62% voted remain. In Northern Ireland, 55, 56% voted remain, divided, of course, on communitarian lines. Uh, and England and Wales both voted to Leave. So if we're talking about a mandate, the question is, where does this mandate uh, arise? And Scotland, 62% voted to remain. 
Interestingly enough, there was not a clear relationship between the vote for Scottish independence in Europe in 2014 and the vote on Europe in 2016. Indeed, about 30% of the people who had voted for independence subsequently voted uh, to leave the EU. So they weren't following the consistent nationalist line, which is independence in Europe. But that has now changed. And so many people who had voted against independence in 2014 are now pro-independent. A smaller number of people have moved the other direction. So now there's an increasing coincidence between supporting independence, independence supporters are pro-Europe, and pro-European people are pro-independence. Between voting for the Nationalist Party, feeling totally Scottish, being pro-Europe and being pro-independence. So there's a polarization within Scotland and something like 50% supporting independence in Europe. In Northern Ireland, uh, you'll be all more familiar with this. On the Catholic Nationalist side, a loss of support in the Good Friday Compromise, a return to support for Irish unification as the having the plurality of, of, of support there. And again, a polarization within Northern Ireland as well as between Northern Ireland and the rest of the United Kingdom. In England, a very interesting finding that support for Brexit correlated not with feeling British, but with feeling English. So it's a form of English nationalism, which rejects not only the EU, but also the periphery if they are an obstacle. Interesting findings that most Brexit voters in England would support, would, would accept not only the secession of Northern Ireland, which is not surprising, but the secession of Scotland as well, if that were the price to pay for Brexit. And even in Wales, support for independence going up to 20 or 30%, which is unprecedented, almost entirely coming from pro-Remain voters. So there's a profoundly centrifugal effect here. The various parts of the United Kingdom are seeking their own place in relation to Europe. But it's very difficult to see what the, how a definitive resolution could be had for this. Because if, as we know, if Ireland unifies, you get rid of one border, but you put another border in place. If Scotland becomes independent, if we get rid of the Scotland's border with the European Union, but you create a new border with England. So the problem is not where the borders are. The problem is borders themselves. The idea of borders with Brexit, which Brexit imposes, uh, are, are, are the problem. And, and fundamentally, you'll be talking about Northern Ireland a great deal. But even in the case of Scotland, there's no easy outcome to all of this. At the same time, the UK government has, in its Brexit negotiations, it would be fair to say, almost completely ignored the position of the peripheral parts of the United Kingdom, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland, except insofar as the Europeans have made them do something about Northern Ireland, which they're trying to undo themselves, even as we speak. But otherwise, very little appreciation of the nature of the post devolution UK state. On the contrary, there have been a series of centralizing measures, some of them just inadvertent, like the first version of the EU withdrawal bill, which says all of those powers that belong to Europe will take them back to Westminster, irrespective of whether they were devolved or not. That was pushed back after resistance at the periphery. The withdrawal agreement bill brought that back in again. But most recently, the UK internal market bill which tries to create for the first time something called the UK internal market to replace the EU internal market that is gone, but does not have the features, key features of the uh, EU internal market, which is the involvement of the member states in the making of law and the principles of subsidiarity and proportionality. On the contrary, the UK unilaterally creates the conditions for an internal market, it is self-enforcing, and although it doesn't fundamentally, in theory, alter the balance of competences, it does simply undermine the exercise of competences in Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. Where does that leave us? Uh, if I got had 10 pounds for everybody who, everybody who's asked me what happens next, and, and I was asked this question 
most recently an hour and a half ago, well, I could go look forward to a very prosperous retirement, uh, but I haven't. This is an existential problem. Yes, there's 50% support for independence in Scotland, but that's not a majority. If Scotland became independent in the EU, the rest of the UK, outside the EU, you've got a border between Scotland and England. Uh, the Northern Ireland question, again, is not where you put those borders, it's the nature of borders, it's the creation of hard borders uh, themselves. And of course, this is all subsumed in the mystery, which is the UK's future relationship with the European Union and how far de facto the UK is going to mirror or accept European regulations, it is going to be a regulation taker, or how far it is going to insist on differentiating from the European Union in, in regulation. I suspect it'll be a bit, a bit of the two. So the constitutional settlement of 1999 has been fundamentally undermined right across the United Kingdom as a result of Brexit. And it's very difficult to see how we can put it together again. So I don't have any answers. I don't have any solutions, but I'm looking forward to the discussions about this because I think the debate about the Northern Ireland Protocol will also shed a lot of light on the general question of the territorial constitution of the United Kingdom and where the other parts of the United Kingdom might end up. Thank you. Thank you uh, for that, uh, Michael. And sort of raising questions, I'm sure that will be returned to um, again uh, today uh, and, and tomorrow. I mean, one thing that strikes me that Brexit opened up um, an area of debate and raised questions that perhaps should have been asked before uh, the referendum. Um, but, you know, uh, these are the things uh, that occur. OK, so as I said, we'll have our speakers first and then we can uh, open up uh, to the floor uh, for questions. So thanks again, Michael. And our next uh, speaker is uh, Professor Katie Hayward, uh, who is a professor of political sociology at Queen's University Belfast and a senior fellow of the UK in a changing uh, Europe think tank where she leads a major ESOC funded project on the topic of the future and status of Northern Ireland after Brexit. She's a fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences, uh, an Eisenhower fellow and a fellow in the Senator George uh, J. Mitchell Institute of Global Peace, Security and Justice at Queen's University. And uh, what Katie will be talking about today is Northern Ireland demographics and divisions. Thank you very much, Derek, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you to Federico for the invitation to take part in this panel. Um, before I begin, um, I want to apologize if there's um, unusual noise. I have somebody over my head on the roof um, <laughs> fixing it, so um, hopefully he won't be too noisy. Um, I came from my home to my office to avoid my noisy dogs, and unfortunately I've got someone on the roof, so apologies in advance if we get interrupted by that. Um, I do have some PowerPoint slides to share uh, because I have quite a few charts to share with you, as is my want as a social scientist. Um, so yes, I'm working to the title of Northern Ireland Demographics and Division. Um, and obviously the whole um, rationale, if you like, behind the protocol was in part the fact that Northern Ireland um, the island of Ireland has unique circumstances, and part of those unique circumstances relate to, if you like, the demographics and divisions within uh, Northern Ireland. I want to begin by noting that, of course, any demographic alignment doesn't in and of itself determine the future for Northern Ireland, and it's important to note from the very beginning that in fact, we constantly have an evolution of identities, of social identities and political identities, and even definitions of what political community means and it's significant in response to a changing political context. So even the Good Friday Belfast Agreement itself um, marks significant changes in the definition of, say, Irish national identity. And so too, as, as Michael was picking up on there, um, perhaps at this very moment, we are seeing change in the uh, um, definition of unionist identity as well. Uh, the question I'm wanting to ask in this is the degree to which there are new politically salient dividing lines in Northern Ireland that are arising as a result of this new context. Um, and part of my working hypothesis there, putting it very simply indeed, is that opposition to Brexit, the roots of which I'll, I'll talk about, 
is in some ways translating into support for the protocol. And this has uh, risks as well as benefits. Um, of course, the, the protocol is a very live issue at the moment. And the current handling of that protocol and indeed the way in which the UK and EU will continue to be responsible for making very significant decisions with regard to the protocol adds an element of unpredictability and a dynamism to this that is really uh, quite significantly new, not least, of course, because we're now moving beyond the British-Irish relationship that was for so long the context for uh, uh, the future of Northern Ireland. Another element of um, uh, uh, complexity to all of this, which I know will be discussed more um, uh, later on in this conference, but is the point of the democratic consent vote mechanism which has um, also um, complicated the degree to which there is political um, salience and particular division over the future of um, the protocol, i.e. the degree to which political identity is connected to the issues of um, uh, the protocol as a, as, a, as a source of identity. So the new context formed by Brexit in the protocol, I hope that's not too noisy for you, is it, is it okay? Okay. Um, <laughs> Uh, of course, so strand three has been significantly changed by Brexit and of itself, the UK and Ireland um, are on different trajectories with um, the UK uh, with the European Union now. Um, and of course, strand two has been significantly changed by the fact that Northern Ireland is no longer in the European Union and the Irish border is more significant for, for many things um, um, and will continue to increase in its significance, i.e. in the friction that is experienced um, um, as um, it, with regards to crossing the Irish border as an external border of the EU. And I'm happy to talk about that more later. And I have, um, and this has a significant impact on North-South cooperation as well. Um, the protocol endeavors, of course, to protect the Good Friday Agreement and all its dimensions. But um, as Michael was mentioning there towards the end, the context within which Northern Ireland's future and indeed the protection of the Good Friday Agreement um, is going to be um, decided has been radically transformed by the protocol. And this image here, um, normally I spell out the meaning of that over several slides. I'm just giving it to you there in a, in a small diagram, but just to show the various dimensions that affect Northern Ireland's governance now. And of, of course, to really try and emphasize the fact that this is evolving. So if you're thinking about demographics, if you're thinking more particularly about political divisions, we see that political identities political ambitions and aspirations, um, most particularly, if you like, as they relate to nationalism and unionism, are very much determined by this new, um, um, uh, completely um, original context and highly, highly complex context. So the question is, what does this mean for the evolution of nationalism and unionism, if you like? And one thing I'm really wanting to emphasize in this is the position of neither, so there's neither unionist nor nationalist, um, which according to the Northern Ireland Life and Time Survey, are uh, the plurality of people in Northern Ireland. Um, uh, what about those, most particularly, what about those who are pro-Remain? And I want to focus on them in particular in this, um, not least to try and complicate our understanding of what demographics and divisions look like in Northern Ireland itself. To put it in context, and I don't need to spell it out to this um, expert audience, but in terms of the Good Friday Belfast Agreement, there are several um, things just worth bearing in mind here. The fact that the competing aspirations of nationalism and unionism are equally legitimate. Um, and the consequence of that, of this framing of the Good Friday Belfast Agreement, is that a disruption to the status quo of Northern Ireland's place in the UK or relationship with Great Britain is seen as a challenge for unionism. Um, Another element of significance for the Good Friday Belfast Agreement is the idea of how it is being legitimized. Uh, obviously, we have the consociational model um, at work to some degree in the institutions set up under strand one, um, i.e. that the, um, the people vote according to um, particular identity blocks. Um, but there are, the theme through here is that the legitimacy of it comes through direct representation. So we have representations from nationalism and unionism, and then in that way, given the sort of um, compulsory, if you like, power sharing, that that um, gives legitimacy to the decisions that are then made from the institutions. 
Um, another consequence of this has been the rise of Sinn Féin and the DUP, the more hardline expressions of nationalism and unionism since the Good Friday Belfast Agreement. And then we must, of course, remember to the context of multi-level governance, as I mentioned before. Um, and what this means in this context, um, I think, is that cross-border cooperation has very real meaning. It has practical consequences. Um, it is enabled by institutional cooperation to some degree, but is also symbolically important as well. So on to Brexit. Um, so the um, North, Northern Ireland voted to remain by 56%. Um, and I'm wanting now to look at uh, the degree to which uh, tr traditional political communities and divisions in Northern Ireland were replicated and reinforced or otherwise through Brexit and the protocol. So um, this is the um, vote from the referendum by Westminster constituency constituencies. And we can see from the Westminster um, election results in 2017, red being DUP, green being Sinn Féin and the independent Sylvia Herman there in North Down. So with the exception of East London Derry, um, which has Gregory Campbell as its MP, we can see the, the clear um, pattern there, putting it very, very, in very stark terms. Interestingly enough, Gregory Campbell's vote is around 40%, and the vote to remain in the EU um, in East Londonderry um, was um, 60%. Um, John Gary's excellent work on breaking down and analyzing the referendum results in Northern Ireland showed very clearly that there was a, a unionist nationalist difference in this. So even though the UUP voted, sorry, campaigned to um, stay in the European Union, the majority of its um, supporters voted to leave. Um, very clear support for remaining in the EU from uh, nationalist parties. And then the Alliance Party, very strong showing for remaining in the EU. Um, and then just to jump straight ahead, the question of the impact that Brexit has had on the grounds for political identities and aspirations in Northern Ireland. So this is looking at the results in the Northern Ireland Life and Time Survey over the period since the, uh, just before, sorry, since just after the Brexit referendum, 2016 to 2020. So we asked them, we've been asking them in NILT two questions. So do you think uh, Brexit makes the United Ireland more likely? And then do you, does Brexit make you more in favor of United Ireland? So um, just things to draw to your attention here. If we look at nationalists, they've increasingly thought that Brexit makes United Ireland more likely, very significantly. So for those who are neither unionist nor nationalist, the big change came in, nine, in 2020, whereas where we've seen huge rise in those thinking that Brexit makes United Ireland more likely. Um, I should say that NILT poll, um, survey work is done in the autumn. So this, this was post the withdrawal agreement. And similarly to amongst unionists now, a plurality of unionists think that Brexit makes United Ireland more likely. Uh, and again, the change then was um, um, in, into 2020. So uh, this is really important to understand if we're trying to uh, appreciate the reasons why unionists are reacting the way that they are to some degree uh, to the protocol. And then in terms of support for United Ireland, um, uh, unsurprisingly unionists are not more supportive of a United Ireland um, as a result of Brexit. Uh, in fact, there's a rise in those who are less in favour of it. Um, and then in terms of those who are neither unionist nor nationalist, you can see here a huge rise in those um, who are saying they're more in favor of United Ireland who are neither unionist or nationalist. This is really significant. Um, and you can see possibly as could have been predicted, a very significant rise amongst nationalists and, uh, uh, of those saying they're more in favor of Irish unity. I wanted to look at this in a slightly different way and look by religion, which I'm normally very, I am for good reason, very cautious about doing, but again, it's a different take on the same question. So comparing 2016 to 2020 results in terms of constitutional preference, um, looking at um, Catholic respondents, we see a significant rise by 15 points of those who are saying that they, they their long-term 
so the preferred long-term future for Northern Ireland um, that they would hold is United Ireland. So now we have um, clear 50% saying that amongst the Catholic population. Um, there could be many reasons for this, not just Brexit. Part of the um, decrease in support for devolution within the UK, sorry about the noise, is uh, obviously the fact, or no doubt the fact that for a good long period during Brexit, we did Brexit withdrawal negotiations, we didn't have a sitting executive and assembly. Um, not, no big change amongst Protestants, but again, the, those of no religion, so um, um, about two thirds of um, those of no religion would just identify as neither unionist nor nationalist, and 25% of unionists, which you can see here quite how significant um, a, a rise that has been there amongst support for Irish unification. And one thing people often point to, and uh, Neil O'Doherty has written an excellent article on this particular theme, is around um, election results change um, since, the, in, since Brexit. Um, and obviously most striking there is the rise in support for other parties, so mainly um, alliance and the non-aligned alliance. Um, and that's really at the at the expense of a uh, unionist vote. So I just wanted to conclude with by sharing some analysis of um, the Lucid Talk poll that has been done for us in Queens for our post Brexit governance project led by Professor David Fenimore. And I'm going to share results with you that we haven't publicized. Um, but this uh, looking in particular at, um, at community identity and the degree to which there are differences between community groups in Northern Ireland vis-a-vis -vis the protocol. So this is highly pertinent, of course, to the question of uh, um, uh, divisions as being rewritten post-Brexit and post-protocol. Um, I, please, you know, I don't expect you to take all of this in, but just basic headline figures in terms of um, people who are thinking this is overall of our poll strongly negative impacts or negative impacts are where those are falling as a result of the protocol. We see they are predominantly in relation to UK relations and British Irish relations. Also, Northern Ireland's constitutional place in the UK and also most particularly on political stability in Northern Ireland. Um, what we have seen in the last poll compared to the previous two, which were in spring and summer, is a rise in the belief that the protocol is um, having a positive impact on the economy and on the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. Um, and this is where we begin to get to the root of the current difficulties, if you like. And, and um, so the question of whether the protocol is on balance a good thing, we can see very big differences between nationalist Snyders and unionists on that question. We see quite how distinct those strong unionists are on that particular point, strong unionists obviously being TUB and DUP in the main. Um, and we see there are more nuanced views or varied views amongst slightly unionists or soft unionists. Um, we had that, is, um, Minister Coveney mentioned the the, there is majority support for the protocol, according to the polls, so this poll is one of those. Um, that tip towards having a majority has come very much from nationalists and indeed neithers being more strongly in favour of the protocol than they were in the up to the summer. Um, and then if we look here in terms of the impact of the protocol on the Good Friday Belfast Agreement, we see that it's seen as very positive by nationalists negative by unionists and um, those who are neither unionists or nationalists on balance they are thinking that it's positive um, and then this is an, another indication of um, the significance of um, uh, political identities and uh, and the protocol in that when we ask them how they'd like the MLAs to vote on the protocol in 2024 so that's the consent vote the first one anyway um, we can see quite how different um, the views are there between unionists and nationalists. Um, neither's on balance being you know, two thirds of them wanting full application of the protocol. Um, and you can see there um, very strong opposition from unionists um, and, and um, uh, a, a clear opposition from those who are slightly unionist. And just one last thing on this. <laughs> um, we did ask um, several questions. Uh, one would be um, to, to the degree to which people agree or disagree 
um, on certain statements. One statement was UK government would be justified if it were to trigger Article 16 now. Um, the average came out at 53% saying it would not be. And you can see then those were neither very much more in line with those who are nationalist and those who are unionist. So a large portion there um, mirroring the, the leavers and remainers um, divide and that's continuing on through infused with regards to the protocol. So looking ahead, um, as I say, we're talking about an evolving situation here and we need to recognize that identities evolve as well. And a particular, a particular interest is the question of how pro-remain uh, neither's or non-aligned will evolve post-Brexit, post-protocol. I've heard Lord Frost say a couple of times recently and others in the UK government, that if they manage to sort the technical problems around the protocol, then they believe that political consensus and agreement in Northern Ireland and support for the protocol will follow. Um, and I'm not sure necessarily whether this is true. <laughs> if you're looking at this particular, uh, at these kind of, um, uh, this kind of data, um, I think a particular question is, is the space for a growth of soft unionist support for the protocol? You see there, there are varied opinions around that. Key here will be political leadership from uh, the soft unionists and to whether there's enough given to them um, in any um, redrawing of the protocol. Uh, that will enable them to support it. In the medium term, we have these assembly elections uh, by next May. Um, already, they you can understand, looking at those polling results, why it is that the DUP think that are very clear that being um, opposed to the protocol is a strong foundation for um, any election campaign. Um, and the consent vote will be um, viewed by many as being more or less equivalent to a border poll. And this is a question more generally as to whether those constitutional matters can be separated from discussion around the protocol and hence the importance of the neithers here. And then in the longer term, uh, uh, perhaps a pertinent question is whether it's possible at all uh, to create the conditions in which cross community legitimacy of the protocol can grow, um, bearing in mind um, the complexity of the situation and the fact that both nationalism and unionism think that this is a critical moment for their future. I'll stop there. Thank you. Yeah, hey, uh, thank you, uh, Katie, for that uh, that talk. Lots of uh, facts and figures that tell a story. I think a snapshot uh, of the of the present moment and the kind of divisions uh, around uh, the issue of Brexit on on a number of different uh, levels. And I'm sure we're going to return to that uh, when we come into uh, the, the questions. And uh, the noise in the background, they weren't building a border post or anything like that. Right on your roof. Okay, so um, thank you for that, Katie. And our next speaker is uh, Professor Oren Doyle, who's a professor in law at Trinity College Dublin, where he was head of school from 2014 uh, to 2018. He holds an LLB and a PhD from Trinity College Dublin and an LLM from Harvard University. He's held visiting positions at the Academia Sinica Te Pai, uh, Oconee University in Milan and Keio uh, University, Tokyo. And he's currently a visiting faculty member at the University of Pennsylvania Carey uh, Law School. Uh, and uh, some of his recent publications, uh, The Brexit Challenge for Ireland and the United Kingdom, Constitutions Under Pressure from Cambridge University Press, um, and um, uh, you know, dealing specifically uh, with um, uh, the issue of uh, Brexit. And so, uh, Professor Doyle today will deal with Ireland, developments and debates. Um, thanks, Derek. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, and thanks, Federico, for the invitation. Thanks, Derek, Derek for the introduction. Um, so, yeah, my paper is titled Ireland, Developments and Debates. And what it tries to get at are the issues that it tries to explore are issues arising for Ireland from the UK's exit from the European Union that to a certain extent are understandably overshadowed at the moment because of all of the important and pressing issues around the protocol. So the four questions that I want to look at over the next 15 minutes or so is first of all, what sort of member state is Ireland post Brexit? Then I want to ask the question for reasons I'll explain about how might Irish unification occur. 
then I'm going to explore the sorts of issues that unification, should it happen, or should it even be on the table, would raise for Ireland and the EU. And finally, sort of to loop back around and ask if unification did happen, what sort of member state might Ireland be in the European Union? I have to enter two important caveats. Okay, so nothing that I say should be taken as advocating for United Ireland. And I'm not making any assessment about how likely that is to happen. It's just more on the political agenda than it used to be and is sufficiently plausible in my view to be worth discussing, but I'm not taking any position on it. Um, much of what I say uh, draws on the following two works. So this is a sort of acknowledgement masquerading as an advertisement or vice versa. Um, so much of the analysis will draw on the Working Group on Unification Referendums on the Island of Ireland, which Professor Hayward was also co-author, um, as is, was Professor O'Neill, or, or Professor O'Leary, I beg your pardon, he'll be speaking tomorrow. And then the other is the um, slightly blurred uh, cover of the book that you just mentioned, The Brexit Challenge for Ireland and the United Kingdom, and some chapters in there that try to draw out uh, some of these issues. Um, to take the first question, then, I said, what sort of member state is Ireland post-Brexit? And I thought that a useful way of exploring that might be around sort of the, the big questions in political debate or what might be the big questions, the political cleavages. For much of the history of the state, the national question dominated. It was, in a way, provided the continuing dividing line between Fine Gael and Fianna Fáil based on their origins, but probably also the robustness of their position in relation to Northern Ireland and the possibility of national unification. Um, with the 1998 agreement, probably prior to that, but certainly with the 1998 agreement, you approach a point really of at least uh, establishment consensus, but I think more than establishment consensus on that, that ceases to be an issue around which Irish politics revolves. It's fair to say that Sinn Féin's position on that is perhaps somewhat ambiguous in that they are supporters of the, uh, the Good Friday Agreement and the constitutional settlement involved therein. They're committed to national unification in the same way well, most other Irish political parties are committed to unification, but Sinn Féin are, it's much more of a priority for Sinn Féin. And so it's possible that with the growth and support for Sinn Féin, that issues around unification might again become a dividing ground in Irish politics. That doesn't seem particularly likely at present. Um, the second characteristic of Ireland as a member state is attitudes to the EU, which have uh, pretty much always been very positive. Uh, membership was approved by large majority in 1972. Subsequent treaties have been ratified as referendum. There were blips with the Nice referendum in 2001, the Lisbon referendum in 2008. Uh, but that was probably due to a mixture of political complacency and Celtic Tiger era complacency. Uh, both uh, were then approved as subsequent referendums by large, major large enough majorities and larger turnouts. In the the Fiscal Compact Treaty was approved first time around in 2012. And you see during Brexit really support for the EU and Irish membership going up into almost uh, despotic territory up into the 90s. Um, so it remains very strongly pro-European country. Uh, a cleavage which has sort of underlain much of Irish politics and I think probably had a disproportionate impact on how Ireland might have been viewed from afar is one between roughly speaking religious conservatives and liberal secularists. And that was a, a story of gradual intermittent, not entirely linear change from the 1970s onwards, but really um, culminating or coming to the last major steps on that journey with the referendums in 2015, approving marriage equality in 2018, uh, authorizing the legislature significantly to liberalize the grounds in which abortions are available, um, followed up by less important referendums, further easing the rules on divorce, removing blasphemy from the constitution. Um, if that was a debate, I think politically that the liberal secularists have won that one. That's no longer, there's a couple of residual issues left over from it, but it's no longer an animating ground of debate in Irish politics. What we do see perhaps starting to emerge is more of a left-right debate, uh, political debate much more focuses on issues of uh, 
the health service, housing, appropriate levels of taxation to pay for those, etc. Um, the dog that hasn't barked is anti-immigrant populism, occasional flickers of that, but it hasn't become expressed in the party political system in any meaningful way. Some people advance um, uh, almost political structure arguments for that, that the PRSTV voting system provides an outlet for the sort of grievances that might otherwise be harnessed by anti-immigrant populist parties. Um, I wonder whether Sinn Féin as an anti-establishment party with a national agenda that might be attractive to people who would otherwise be attractive to anti-immigrant populism is perhaps uh, blocking a share of the political market there, whereas of course Sinn Féin is very much in favour of immigration, so it doesn't fit those characteristics. Anyway, so that's sort of a sense of where Ireland is and perhaps makes us, not a political scientist by any means, but perhaps makes Ireland look a little bit more like a normal EU member state, or perhaps a normal EU member state circa 2000, 2005, um, than it had done in the past. Brexit causes particular challenges, and uh, wholly apart from issues over Northern Ireland and the protocol, and I think has prompted uh, concerns or focus on renewed focus on alliance and influence building. Uh, so there's a concern that Ireland in the EU without the UK will lack uh, a country of which we were with like mind on many issues. So as a lawyer, the, I know the courts or chief justice and so on are very concerned that we are now the sole, uh, the only solely common law country uh, in the European Union that places a whole lot of extra responsibility on our own civil service to be able to engage efficiently around the drafting of laws, cases before the European Court of Justice. And what you see, I think, is political issues trying to develop alliances with other EU member states. Um, I'm thinking about those alliances more strategically, perhaps, than we had to do in the past. A real push to uh, develop the pool of candidates, Irish candidates, would be eligible to serve in the European institutions, a feeling that we've allowed ourselves to become underrepresented there. So government policy from Department of Foreign Affairs tries to address that. And also an attempt to refocus on alliance and influence building across Great Britain outside of the Dublin London state to state relationship with the opening and further strengthening of consulates, uh, specific arrangements with Wales recently. Um, so that is sort of, uh, yeah, Ireland's position as, a, as an EU member state on the issues that are of concern to us, perhaps prompted by, by Brexit. Um, I then want to go on now and look at how unification might happen. So it turns on the Good Friday Agreement um, and requires the consent freely and concurrently given North and South to bring about a united Ireland. So how does that work out in practice? Um, this is seriously abbreviated, but the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland has discretion uh, to call a border poll uh, to see whether there is consent in Northern Ireland for unification. Okay. However, the Secretary of State is under an obligation if it appears likely to them that a majority would vote in favour of unification. A lot of ink has been spilled on trying to work out how the Secretary of State might assess whether such a majority exists. Um, there is, uh, I think what the conclusion we come to in the report is that all forms of, there's no one conclusive form of evidence, all forms of evidence could and should be considered, including opinion poll evidence, uh, representation in the assembly, representation of the Northern Ireland constituencies at Westminster and so on. All of those should inform the Secretary of State's view. The referendums, there must be a referendum in the South as well for reasons I will be prepared to explain if we had a lot longer. Um, those referendums must be concurrent. Don't think this means simultaneous, but it does mean that they have to be more or less at the same time and on the same set of issues. Um, that has an important implication that it's not possible for Northern Ireland to vote first, then to carry out some negotiations and then have the South to vote on something which would effectively be different. Okay, so they must be voting on effectively the same question. If both North and South vote in favour, um, the referendums mandate unification. Unification must occur under the terms of the agreement. 
but legislation is required in Dublin and London to give effect to it. Now, the agreement was clearly written uh, under the expectation that relations between Dublin and London would be good, and if unification referendums were passed, Dublin and London would work together in good faith to give effect to those votes and present complementary legislation to their respective parliaments and unification would go ahead smoothly. Um, I'm not so sure that those assumptions still hold. There is in all of this a sort of runaway train scenario in which it is possible that the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland might be legally directed by a court to call a poll. Um, unlikely, but possible. Um, if that happened, the poll would have to go ahead in the North. If the North voted in favour, there would have to be a vote in the South. And then there would have to be legislation to give effect to those two votes. But nobody would have been able to do any planning, or at least they wouldn't have been able to negotiate any details prior to the votes taking place. Um, and so this uh, leaves a real risk that people find themselves in a situation where unification has to go ahead. Um, but there's no agreement on the terms that uh, that should uh, on the terms of unification, which is uh, reminiscent of, of Brexit in many ways. So this tends, in my view, there are other opposing views on this to suggest that a detailed plan before the referendums, insofar as possible, will be desirable rather than waiting until after the referendums. The sort of Brexit model of vote first and ask questions later, um, not being such a good idea, in my view. What are the sorts of issues that would have to be considered in that context? Um, there's ones for the Irish state, uh, primarily constitutional issues, there's lots of issues. Constitutional issues are really around would devolution for Northern Ireland to continue or not? So would it be a fully unitary state or a unitary state with a devolved Northern Ireland? And there's also issues about Irish identity in the constitution and the extent to which they should be amended to make it more welcoming for those of a formerly unionist disposition. Um, but the ones that I want to focus on a little bit more today are what might the issues be for the European Union, uh, because the European Union has a stake in this, the European Council having decided in April 2017 that if Irish unification were to occur, Northern Ireland would become part of the EU in a sort of East German accession style or East German absorption style rather than an accession process. Um, so this means any votes in favour have consequences for the European Union. Some of them around EU citizenship. Would the EU be prepared to grant EU citizenship to British citizens of Northern Ireland who are exercising their right not to be Irish citizens? Um, at the moment, there's probably very little divergence between Ireland and Northern Ireland, but the longer the UK stays out of the EU, the more that is going to grow. Uh, so what plans would the EU have for Northern Ireland catching up again with the Aki Communautaire? There'd be a sea border between Ireland and Great Britain to negotiate. That's probably going to have implications for fishing, um, fishing rights. What's the EU's position going to be on that? And also there's a question about how the protocol itself comes to an end. Okay, there's some ways for that, but it probably requires the agreement of, of the UK. Um, so all of these are questions that the EU will have to address, um, which I think the EU probably, the EU institutions can't wait until after the votes. Having made this commitment that the effect of the votes would be the EU membership, they're probably not going to be able to say we're not going to give any answers to the questions until after people have voted. Uh, so European institutions and the member states need to start thinking about this at some level. Um, that's so speculative, I will leave that for now because I'm nearly out of time. Uh, but maybe just to draw some lessons from the overall Brexit process to these discussions around unification, um, a point to perhaps the importance of planning, a point that Derek touched on earlier. Um, how do you design the referendum process, plans before the votes, plans after? The difficulty of negotiations to implement a broad and unspecified political mandate when um, that's happening in the context of distrust between the parties. And um, finally, the seems me from an outside perspective that the electoral interests of the UK Conservative Party are a significant driver of constitutional change within the United Kingdom. And it's quite possible that 
Irish unification were to happen might play out in that context as well of a Labour Secretary of State uh, agreeing or deciding that a border poll should be held and a Conservative Party perhaps campaigning for re-election on the grounds that a border poll shouldn't have been held and committed to not implementing the result of the poll. Um, so I think there's a it could has the potential to play out in very messy circumstances, and it's probably better to be thinking about those sooner rather than later. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Oren, uh, for that. Again, in terms of the local uh, issues, very much in the relevancy and the idea of beginning that kind of discussion, I think is is uh, is is important. So look, we've had our three uh, panelists, and we've touched upon. Uh, Northern Ireland, Ireland, uh, and and the UK from a sociological uh, view, from a legal view, constitutional view, uh, and from um, a, a, a political uh, view. I have a few questions already in in the chat box, and I'll sort of begin with them. But then, if anybody has any kind of questions or queries, to sort of put your hand up in in terms of the Zoom function, or or to put them in in the chat box. But um, just one question here from uh, from Shauna. Um, how or is the UK government dealing with the conflict of supposedly speaking to the other EU, uh, other international countries on behalf of the UK and its reasons versus speaking for English interests? I suppose that tension between um, speaking outwards towards Europe uh, and, and the world, but then also speaking to, to the regions within the UK Perhaps that's one for, for Michael, but anybody can sort of come in on that. Should, 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 I, should I come in on that then? Yeah. Yeah, the answer is that they're not taking account of the <laughs> views of the world. And the normal formula is to say in advance, we will consult, which is not the same as engagement. It's not the same as the consent principle that has never been really uh, invoked, although it is now being put into little bits of the internal markets bill, but in a very vague way. Or to say, we'll consult the devolves before we go into negotiations, but it's always too late. It's at the wrong stage of the process. And whereas the devolves were part of the British negotiating team within the European Union for day-to-day -day policy for many years, even before devolution with the offices, that is not happening, that did not happen with the Brexit negotiations, it did not happen with the negotiations over the TCA, and it is not happening with the working out of, 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 of future arrangements. Of course, there's the Northern Ireland potential veto over the protocol in some time in the future, but that is the only instance in which the devolves have any decisive influence. And then, of course, the future negotiations of trade deals with third countries is being done, again, without reference to either the political interests or the economic interests of, of the devolves. That's another respect in which the UK is reconstituting itself as a unitary state as a result of Brexit. Okay, thank you, Michael. It's a very straightforward answer. Another question, I think this might be for uh, uh, Katie, or did you want to come in there, Katie? Yes, very briefly, just it's it's a good question, and I, it just um, uh, reminds me of the fact, of course, that if, that the British government and the Irish government are both talking for Northern Ireland internationally, but saying very different things, um, and they've been doing that since um, since the referendum, and of course that that has significant ramifications for for here, um, and indeed, and how different communities here view external. Um, actors, including the EU, and of course, including America as well. Okay, I think this question is for you, Katie. But uh, from Colm, um, you know that the, the the economic, I suppose, issues around the protocol do they trump uh, the traditional religious um, sort of cultural uh, positions in terms of those kind of uh, of figures that you're talking about? I mean, which is more important now? Do you think? Um. Well, so okay, so the so the Liv University of Liverpool survey um, a couple of weeks ago was suggesting that the protocol is is you know down the list of of priorities when people think about what concerns them. Obviously, the the crisis in the health 
sector, et cetera, is more important. I say obviously, but, but it, that's coming forward. Um, that said, when we asking people, um, um, will the protocol and, um, um, and your support for it other otherwise, or thinking about the consent vote, will that determine your choice of candidate, how you vote in 2022? Only 20% of people say, no, it won't. Um, and this is the challenge in Northern Ireland in the post-agreement political landscape, right? That it is um, uh, what's seen as being, uh, what, what becomes the major motivation for people's choice of uh, candidate where they cast their votes and indeed um, how the order of pre um, preference that they give different parties, that's a, that's a different calculation oftentimes to the one in which they're looking at, um, you know, manifesto commitments, whatever that's worth, uh, and and everything else. And so this is the this is the this is the challenge now that, in no insignificant way, the consent vote has meant that um, the protocol actually is going to be um, a big issue in in voting. Um, and then in terms of the economic impacts of of the protocol, so another work I've done in the border region. Um, people, when you ask about the impact that the protocol and Brexit are having, they, they talk about economic effects, but their concerns are for political stability and the ramifications for identity and relations between communities. So that far and above all else, it's a political stability question that, that is of most concern to people, even if it's the, the economic impacts that are um, perhaps more directly felt. Question here from, from Katie, and this could be for, for anyone, I suppose, but how well understood by the public is the protocol, if you know what I mean. So the idea that they're for and against uh, the protocol, but do the, the public have a, a solid understanding of, of, of its impacts, of what it is? Um, so I'll go first and listen to other people. So, um, so in our panel poll that we use for Lucid Talk, 75% of people say they have a good understanding of the protocol. Um, but about 45% say that reliable information is available on it. So <laughs> this is a, this is what you get in this kind of that kind of polling. I think people have a sense that they un, that they understand it and its ramifications. But in fact, the 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 information around it is not readily available. And if you begin to talk to people about it, it is quite clear that there is a lot of misunderstanding and misperception. Um, and we tested this in our most recent testing the temperature poll there in that we asked specific questions just to see the degree to which people understood. And it was around, around grace periods. One question was around Article 16 and what it would mean. And 43% um, uh, um, of people thought it just meant temporary and specific measures um, um, to um, suspend part of the protocol and 43% thought it meant a wholesale suspension of the protocol, um, which is wrong. So there's a lot of misunderstanding uh, and it's not surprising given that there are, there's um, a lot of um, debate around the ramification of the protocol. And this is all the way through to things like ECJ, where, where when you begin to ask people about it, for example, some people I've been meeting with who are concerned around it, they're worried about being called up before a foreign court so uh, this is what will then translate into how people, whether they go on a protest or what, how they might cast their vote. So this misinformation and misunderstanding is, is a really serious concern. Yeah. Any other comments from Oren or, or Michael around that, that sort of understanding of... of, of... Well, there's, there's quite a little bit of, of, of polling around the time of the so-called backstop. Uh, and the negotiations, and when people were asked about specific things about inspections of cattle at the port of Larne and things, well, they said that's all right, it wasn't a problem. But predictably, once it was politicized and became salient, it then became a proxy, I think, for a whole lot of other things and tapped into existing polarization. And that, that's really not surprising because people can't be expected to understand. If we have a difficulty explaining this, then how are people in the street? explain it but it seems to come and, and i think it's more consistent with what, what katie's saying it seems to have become something that itself is polarizing because of what, of what it seems to symbolize is shorthand for for a lot of other things that are deeply rooted in the identity politics of northern ireland yeah. 
Um, I see that uh, uh, Bertie O'Hearn is in the audience and just it struck me that if there's confusion around the protocol, perhaps there's confusion around the Good Friday Agreement itself um, that uh, Bertie O'Hearn was, was uh, central in terms of getting over the line and bringing into being. Any comments on, on that, like in terms of the way it's become a kind of football, I suppose, in, um, in, in the debate in, uh, in the present moment? You, you, you'll let me in, are you? Yes, I am. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, can I just thank the speakers? It, it's re re really, uh, really interesting. Um, I, I think, listen, the, Mark McGuinness always used to say that the most read document ever in Northern Ireland was the, the Good Friday Agreement because uh, the people literally in the, in the hills and the ditches as well as the, the cities and towns actually read the document and questioned the document, particularly um, uh, his, his colleagues. Uh, so I, I suppose it's been well and, 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 and truly uh, debated ever since. There was some ambiguity around some things, not as much as I think people sometimes say. People say that we designed a lot of it uh, to create ambiguity and make it seem uh, that, that, that that's not, not true. It might've turned out that way. With the exception of decommissioning, I think decommission was the one where we 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 were um, uh, trying to trying to find a way through and not fairly clearly, and that's why it took us nine years to uh, to 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 deal with it. it. But just listening to the um to the speaker, kind of just make two points. One, I I think on the 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 list of of items that have to be dealt with uh, before a referendum. I think the idea of having a referendum as some people articulate, and some people, and there's been some university work in, in the UK on this, um, saying that we should have the represent, referendum first. I think that's insanity. Um, a, a referendum uh, before the detail is worked out would mean is it will be rejected both north and south. Uh, in my view, there's no doubt about that. Um, people are far too uh, politically wise. They're used to referendums, particularly in the south, uh, they want to see the detail and it's not the detail about costs it's not about budget which is sometimes said it's just it it's just the detail so that's that's one point the other point is um the difficulty with the protocol and whether it's understood or misunderstood i spend a lot of my life still in the north the, the reality is in east belfast and in the and in, in the ghettos and in the areas where you're likely to get trouble the people haven't got a clue about the protocol not a clue. And they see it as identity. They see it as a road to the Dublin government taking over again. And this is a pathway to that. And, and that's the hard reality. And then um, I've sat in on two very sizable meetings in, in, in the month of October. And it was just quite clear the idea of it's about trade or it's about all the things that we know it's about uh, just passes them by. In fact, they're not interested. It, it, it's seen as a, a trick by the, the, the south uh, to move the border from across the island uh, and to put it down the Irish Sea as a trap for Dublin. That's how they see it. And even those who you might consider to be um, a, a bit more intelligent and articulate. So, the, so that is the difficulty. So we're trying to do two things. Uh, we're trying to solve the difficulties of medicine and, you know, meats and everything else uh, in the protocol. But there's, there's another issue of the protocol, which is what's in the head and the ideological one. And that's a far more difficult one to do. And, you know, Jeffrey Donaldson well understands uh, uh, how we might get over the detail. And the reason he keeps on about the other issue is because he's trying to, which I, I, I don't blame him for, he, he's trying to, to serve the, 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 the loyalist community as well. So I just make those, those few points. Thank you for that. Um, Another sort of question here um, the, from Tom Flynn, um, that increasingly, and this is for you, Katie, increasingly uh, people are sort of expressing themselves as exclusively Northern Irish, uh, as opposed to Irish or, or British, or some combination of, of both. And is there any kind of polling or data uh, on, on that sort of sense of, of connection uh, or community and how it might sort of um, react to border polls or indeed the protocol and so on. 
Yes, yeah, so there's been a lot of work on that from people like Kevin McNichols and John Tong has written on that um, and others, um, really fascinating work. Um, and uh, so it's, it's not really a political identity per se, it's most popular amongst younger Protestants who are less likely to use the term British to describe their identity. Um, and this is in contrast to younger um, Catholics who are more likely to talk about themselves as, as Irish. Um, so yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a growing area of interest, but I think possibly more significant is what's happened to British and Irish post-Brexit and the fact that we now have fundamental and real inequality between British and Irish citizens, or citizenships, perhaps I should say, um, as is experienced now <laughs> when, when British citizens uh, travel to the EU. Um, and, and I think that's going to become uh, more apparent um, over time. So that's sort of, that, that's, a, that's a real um, jolt, I think, to some of the assumptions um, behind the foundations for the agreement itself. And one thing, just to pick up on um, what um, uh, Bertie Herm was saying, it is worth bearing in mind that quite a lot of the anti-protocol um, protests and um, provocation, if you like, comes from people who never accepted the Good Friday Belfast Agreement to begin with, um, and who do see this as an opportunity to, um, oh, sorry, I mean the protocol context as an opportunity to push and push and push on that one and the compromises or accommodation that was made in the Good Friday Belfast Agreement. Um, I'm talking about certain quarters of loyalism, just as we had the same for certain quarters of republicanism who didn't accept the Good Friday Belfast Agreement and who saw Brexit as a means to push as well to get what they their ultimate ambition. So um, for all our concern for the Good Friday Agreement, it's, it's important to bear that in mind that there's, there are um, sections who still don't accept it. And uh, this is one reason why this is such a disruptive um, force, if you like, Brexit and the protocol, because there's that element in reactions to it. Uh, one question here. How serious is the UK government about effective intergovernmental relations? I mean, how serious are they about, I suppose, those connections within the UK, but also then uh, on, on a broader scale? Any comments, Michael? Yes, they, they, they talk about it a lot, but it's never really been a priority. It's never been institutionalized since the evolution. Responsibility keeps on shifting. It's the Ministry of Justice, it's Cabinet Office, it's Michael Gove, it's somewhere or other. Because in Whitehall, this is not a discrete thing. This is a, you may have to deal with the Scots on agriculture and the Irish on fisheries or, or, or whatever. There's no one place because there's no federal understanding of the United Kingdom, whatever, in, in Whitehall. So this is a series of bilateral relationships governed by the principle of, of hierarchy, frankly. Uh, and every now and then there will be a review. There was one a couple of years ago by Andrew Dunlop. There's just been another one recently. There's another one ongoing. And we say the same thing to them, that you must have a degree of formalization of this and you must get rid of the idea that ultimately the UK government always has the last word, because although it may often not, not always exercise its power in that overt hierarchical way, the fact that they can has a feedback effect on the entire negotiation process and all the way down to official level, because you know that eventually the UK is going to get its way. People talk about federalism, People talk about federalism in the United Kingdom when they run out of anything else to say because they don't know what federalism is. My colleague uh, Alvin Jackson, who's well known in, in Northern Ireland, of course, calls it the one drug of constitutional debate. <laughs> um, but there's that lack of understanding that this is a devolved policy. Uh, and every few years I'm brought down to, to talk about it. The last one, I went down there and they gave me a huge lanyard saying devolution matters. And I'm like saying, devolution and you. They said, you can take the mug home with you. I said, no, I'm going to leave it here because you're the people who need to understand. <laughs> and back in 1976, 
when we were going to have a Scottish Assembly and a Welsh Assembly, I taught a course in the Civil Service College on devolution, because all the incoming civil servants had to learn about devolution, whether they wanted to or not. That didn't happen in 1999. And, and, and it's only happened sporadically since that. Maybe that's inevitable in such an asymmetrical system. Hmm. That's gonna happen. But, but there's something fundamentally wrong. And when Whitehall wakes up to this, it's always a bit too late. Uh, they, they, they run in, constantly run into crisis. Things like the first withdrawal bill, I was just amazed that nobody had thought that it was a problem that you take back all the devolved powers. It was just convenient. The internal market bill, similarly, I was just amazed that they hadn't learned from the previous episodes since the 2016 referendum, but, but they hadn't. So that, that learning is, is just not there. So when there's a crisis, something is done, but on a day-to-day -day basis, there's not very much going on by way of intergovernmental relations. I mean, this is something that, just to bring Oren in, I suppose, from an Irish perspective as well, but is, is Brexit and the reactions within the UK just been utterly reactive since 2016? You know, that it's just reacting to each kind of crisis or issue as it arises, uh, or, or is there a plan? And I suppose this is where Oren comes in in terms of a kind of, an internal discussion here within Ireland in terms of reunification that we need to have a plan or at least begin to sort of think of having a plan or, or put some shape on, on how we might approach these kind of issues. Um, yeah, so that's the first bit looking from the outside in terms, it seems the UK government is just Brexit focused almost to the exclusion of all else on a particularly ever purifying type of Brexit for whatever reason that is. And that probably makes a meaningful commitment to intergovernment relations between Britain and Ireland difficult. Um, then in terms of, uh, from the Irish perspective, the need for planning and to, to pick up on what Bertie Ahern said, I agree with the need for planning, absolutely. But I think the two things, there's two slight problems with it. Uh, the first is I think the UK wouldn't engage in planning or negotiations before any vote in the United, in Northern Ireland in favour of unification. I think that would be seen in the UK and possibly rightly so as sort of selling out the constitutional position in advance. And second, um, unionists in Northern Ireland have every reasonable, legitimate political incentive not to engage in any discussions or planning in my view, before a United Ireland actually happens until legislation is passed in Westminster and uh, the deed is done, if that ever comes to place. So you're left in a situation, I think, that the planning that has to be done has to be primarily led by the Irish government. And insofar as it's completely in control, and that would be specifying constitutional changes that might take place in the event of unification, the Irish government should in a consultative way, but ultimately it's up for the Irish government to put those forward to the people. The Irish government is in a sense making a, a dual offer or an offer to two electorates, North and South, and uh, has an incentive to make that offer as attractive as possible to both of them, and has to go a long way down the road, I think you're right, in terms of working out the detail of that offer insofar as it can, given the legitimate reluctance of the British government to be involved prior to a vote, and also the legitimate reluctance of Northern Unions to be involved at that point. Thank you. Um, I have um, a question here from uh, Michael Quinn. Um, um, I know from uh, the, 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 from Sean actually, and then Michael Quinn, that the, the 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 UK government being prepared to break international law. Uh, and how has that impacted on Irish or wider, e wider EU views uh, on the UK's standing? Or does it have any uh, impact? Any comments? Or everybody just going to stay silent on that? <laughs> or you're a lot. You're a lawyer. Um, yeah, you, you sort of wonder whether the. It certainly has an impact in Ireland, and it certainly has an impact in the discussion about unification, um, that it got to the point where um, you could no longer, I'm not saying that this would happen, but you could no longer be sure that the UK Parliament would respect votes to unify. Um, they've established that they're willing to break international law in certain circumstances, and I would see this one as going 
potentially close enough to core issues of national identity that they might decide to break international law and not respect the votes. Um, so I think it's a factor there to the extent you're thinking about unification. Otherwise, I sort of had half a suspicion that other countries in the world would, would be prepared to factor it out and say, yes, like the UK um, is, you wouldn't trust them around issues of Brexit, for example, but that's not going to spill over into their other international agreements. Um, but I suspect it doesn't play well in the United States, um, uh, given the concern of the, the current president in particular for Northern Ireland. So it has some spillover effect, but I don't think it's necessarily going to contaminate the way all countries around the world view the UK. Katie? I mean, to be fair, Aaron, they were only going to break international law in a limited and specific way. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm messing. Um, so it's a very, it's a very live concern. And um, there are also concerns around what the plans might be with respect to Article 16 and how that would be managed domestically if it were to be invoked by the UK. And although uh, the tone at the moment is, is, is more positive, I don't think, of course, that threat has gone away. And, and Lord Frost was mentioning just yesterday on Good Morning Ulster, in fact, he, he started his contribution by mentioning Article 16. Um, and the reason why there are concerns around that and around plans that the UK might have in relation to that connect to obviously, basically the, the potential ramifications for overriding the withdrawal agreement um, um, and particularly its application um, in domestic law um, as it relates to Northern Ireland. And, and there are two key points here, one are one is concerns that then arise with respect to other protections um, that are um, and other commitments made in the protocol, most particularly with regards to individual rights, equality and safeguards, so Article 2, and the status of that. Um, I know those are real concerns. Um, and then secondly, more broadly, is the question of um, the general point about rule of law. And if it's the case that the UK government equips itself or attempts to equip itself to break international law. Um, the standing, therefore, of the rule of law, um, even all the way down to um, how it's how the Good Friday Agreement is then seen, and the commitments that are um, made there, um, and including in the Northern Ireland Act, and also just more broadly, um, the fact that the peace process depends on, on that um, and on people being able to say, um, no matter what your point of view, no matter how intense your frustrations or concerns, that there are democratic means of expressing them and that the rule of law um, and indeed upholding the police um, service, etc. All of these things should be maintained. And so what is interesting is probably not well appreciated is a connection between on the street level management of um, division all the way up to that, that very highest level of what might even be said um, on the on the house of the on the floor of the House of Commons. Mm, okay, thank you, Katie. Um, this is another kind of question from Michael Quinn, but it, it goes goes back to, to the other question, you know, the, the priorities of economics um, versus sort of cultural issues or or, or uh, identity uh, politics. Um, and Michael's saying, do you think the cost of of Northern Ireland exiting the EU outweigh the traditional divides in the minds of the UK government, and are we likely to see a Northern Ireland hangover when the reality of Brexit uh, hits hits home? Um, so again, I suppose it's the idea of economics versus, you know, uh, cultural politics, well, which is more important or takes precedence. I mean, Michael, in terms of the internal UK. Is it all about economics or is it uh, identity politics at the moment? Well, Brexit is, is fundamentally about identity politics and a particular conception about the nation and the state and the relationship between them, driven, as I said, not so much by British identity, but by English identity expressing itself through Britishness. There are multiple strands in British unionism, I say British as opposed to Irish unionism. Uh, one of them, which is almost disappearing, 
as an acceptance that this is a plural union and that devolution is a legitimate expression of variation within a union. Uh, another one is, is centralist, centralizing kind of Jacobin unionism. That we saw under Margaret Thatcher, we've seen it again more recently, but the overwhelming strand is that we care about Scotland, we don't really care about Northern Ireland, and that pretty much corresponds to attitudes in public opinion, that Northern Ireland is not seen as an indispensable part of the state in the way that Scotland is. But increasingly amongst public opinion, Scotland is also seen as dispensable, and who knows uh, Wales next. So the notion of UK unionism has always been poly polyvalent, it's always been different in Ireland, different in Scotland, different uh, in Wales, but that difference is becoming ever more evident and the difficulty for the present government, present Conservative Party, is that they've discovered the union, they've discovered that the union is, is in crisis, but they don't actually know what the union is, they don't know what it is that they're defending, hence this muddling through and rather arbitrary picking on some issues rather than others, suddenly discovering their inner Irish unionism, so the protocol is somehow uh, a problem, doing things in Scotland that they think are going to get them votes, which just illustrates their misunderstanding of the way Scotland works. So fundamentally, there is a problem at the centre here, a lack of understanding of the complex nature of, of, of this state. So we could, we could muddle our way through the disintegration of the United Kingdom, where not for the fact that pulling the United Kingdom apart is even more complicated than, than, than keeping it together. Okay, folks, uh, we're coming near uh, the end of it. I was going to sort of say half jokingly, so where will we be in two years time? You know, um, will it all work out as, you know, our mothers and fathers used to say, you'll be grand, it'll be fine, it'll all work out. Um, one imagines that it won't, <laughs> and it won't work out in a very easy uh, kind of way. Um, Look, I found the three papers uh, fascinating because we were focusing on the UK, focusing on Northern Ireland and Ireland, and the kind of different responses to the crisis of, of Brexit. And yet, uh, with different responses, we can see similarities or common grounds that perhaps is something to sort of think about um, in, in the future. I mean, Michael, you constantly talked about the periphery, and certainly in Ireland, the EU has been a way for the periphery, uh, us on the kind of edge of Europe as it were, to have a voice and to kind of reimagine ourselves uh, in, in a kind of positive light. Um, and, and perhaps that's something that the UK <laughs> needs to sort of think about as well as that kind of tension between the centre and, um, and, and, and the periphery. So listen, on behalf of everybody here, and we've had up to 130 people here uh, since uh, two o'clock. I'd just like to sort of thank uh, Aaron and Michael and Katie for three really great papers that sets up the tone uh, and the scope uh, of this gathering uh, this afternoon uh, and tomorrow. And so if we can all either in the real world or virtually with our Zoom sort of put our hands together uh, for our speakers,